Greetings. Welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing climate change, abrupt climate change, and things adjacent. Thank you always for your comments and discussion. I appreciate you, and uh, thank you for your very helpful donations. I do receive them, and I just want to acknowledge those who have donated the channel. Um, every little bit helps. Um, because I would rather be doing this than doing stupid things with my time. I don't know why these dogs really love to torture me. Nothing was happening before I started the video, and now um, I can't. I can't get them to stop without yelling at them, and I don't really want to get up and yell at them. Okay, uh, let's see if I can get through this. Uh, so I'm gonna. Do some fast reading tonight. This is a this is a recent news from a couple days ago. A heat wave grips north and south, north and south, India, uh, Andhra Pradesh to touch 47 degrees. So this is from May 9th, a few days ago. Uh, the northern part of India continues to remain under the grip of an intense heat wave, with Jammu recording the highest temperature of the season at over 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, known as the winter capital of Jammu and Kashmir, Jammu for the first time touched 40 degrees Celsius in this summer season. However, th thunderstorm and lightning accompanied by gusty winds at isolated places are likely over Jammu and Kashmir over the next few days. Um, people in Andhra, Andhra Pradesh are likely to witness severe heat wave in the next three days. Andhra Pradesh government's real-time governance society has said. Uh, the temperature in the state is oscillating between 41 and 45 degrees for the past week. Hot, hot, hot. Um, there's heat wave condition going on in Andhra Pradesh, especially in the state's central parts. This mainly includes districts of Guntur, Krishna, Prakasam, and Nellore. For the next two to three days, the severity will be high in Krishna, Guntur, Nellore, and Prakasham. The temperature is likely to rise to 47 degrees Celsius. Uh, the request, we request the general public to be cautious. The government has also taken steps to mitigate the situation. Um, so, yes, heat waves and more heat waves. And I recently heard that it was... Uh, um, was it vintage violet said in Portland, it was 90 degrees the last couple of days. So 90 degrees is not a normal temperature for Portland period. Any time of the year, that's hot even for summertime, right? That's not a usual temperature. Although over the last five years, Portland and Seattle have both, um, witnessed, uh, very hot temperatures, you know, high eighties and nineties, but in the summertime, um, when you'd think it most likely to get that. I, I wouldn't consider this summer, summer, summertime yet. It's early May. That would be spring. Uh, very early for Portland to be 90 degrees and considering that 90 degrees is out of the norm anyways for Portland. So uh, not good. I'm going to move on to a new uh, way past what the fuck installment. This is called Random Thoughts from Faraway Places. Starts with a quote from W.B. Yeats, The Second Coming. And what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches toward Bethlehem to be born. The quotes in this piece are from many sources. Some come from movies or songs or things I heard here and there. Some of them are mine, but most of them are from other people. I just don't remember where I got them. So if you see one whose author you know have a cookie, and congratulate yourself for being just too clever. Is it all a dream? Why is the phone ringing? I roll over. It's hot and I've kicked off the covers. I can't find the clock. Why is the phone ringing? Where is the damn clock? I dig through the pile of blankets on the floor and buried at the bottom is the clock. It is 3.30 a.m., so it must be bad news. Good news always waits until a reasonable hour. Bad news demands to be heard. No one ever called me in the middle of the night to tell me their dog had puppies. The phone is still ringing. The worst would thrive and the dreamers would die. 
Uh, anybody know who that's from? I don't know. They win by controlling every possible outcome. Uh, that's from a documentary, I believe, only because it was explained to me earlier today. Can you wake up and say, regardless of how old you are, that there is nothing more you want? Uh, and here's a quote from the Boondocks Saints. Not how far will we go, but will we go as far as is needed? Begin at the beginning, the king said very gravely, and go on until you come to the end. Then stop. It's from Lewis Carroll. We aren't walking in the dark. We are the dark. I'm going to read that again. We aren't walking in the dark. We are the dark. That's from Person of Interest, a very good show on Netflix. The world breaks everyone, and afterward many are stronger at the broken places. Ernest Hemingway. Uh, being missed means you meant something to someone. Anonymous or don't know. Is it progress if a cannibal uses a fork? Don't know. If you are burning down your house, the solution is not to move. Don't know. Oh, don't know. Sins in the service of ideals. Don't know. Electronic hallucinations that take the place of literacy. Chris Hedges. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Voltaire. The real point of life is dogs. Derek Jensen. I came here with good intentions, and like all good intentions, they went up in smoke, and so I drink in order to forget I ever had them. Don't know. Preaching to the choir is for showboats and sissies. Don't know, but I'd like to know who, that, who did, uh, said that one. Stress can ruin every day of your life. Dying only ruins one. Temporary constructs of a feeble intellect to justify an existence that is without meaning or purpose. What I think about help huckleberry bushes is not as important as huckleberry bushes. Derek Jensen. I didn't promise you honestly, I promised honesty, I promised you truth. We want our heroes to relieve us of moral choices. The struggle of man against power is the struggle of memory against forgetting. That's from Milan Kundera. We can demand slight improvements to our current, current conditions, imagining something else entirely is distinctly more difficult, from Naomi Klein. I look for people who don't talk to talk with. Meng how John. The single-minded pursuit of happiness with happiness equated with wealth and power create a population consumed by anxiety and self-loathing. Few achieve the imagined pinnacle of success, and those who do are often psychopaths. Building a society around th these goals is masochistic. masochistic. It shuts down any desire for self-knowledge because the truth of our lives is unpleasant. We fill the spiritual vacuum with endless activities, entertainment, and nonstop electronic hallucinations. We flee from silence and contemplation. We are determined to avoid facing what we have become. Chris Hedges. The rebel does not define success the way elites define success. Those who resist refuse to kneel before the idols of mass culture and the power elites. They are not trying to get rich. They understand that when you stand with the oppressed, you get treated like the oppressed. And uh, so he says, sounds like something Chris Hedges would say. We are kept powerless by buying into the divisiveness propagated by elites. Uh, Chris Hedges sounding one. You are not rewarded for positions of virtue. It is more likely you will be punished. Mainstream act activism takes industrial capitalism as a given and forces the natural world to conform instead of taking the natural world as a given and forcing industrial capitalism to conform. That's from Derek Jensen. Freedom scares you because it means responsibility. That's from Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys. I got to the river and then the river got to me. And the last one is I don't have an anger problem. I have an idiot problem. That's from Hank Hill. Um, and uh, I, I definitely have an idiot problem. I suppose we all have an idiot problem. Um, let's move on. This could be long, and I hope that I can either read it fast or kind of skip through the meat of this article. This is from Forbes, titled, The Reason Renewables Can't Power Modern Civilization is Because They Were Never Meant To. This is from Michael Schellenberger. Over the last decade, journalists have held up Germany's renewables energy transition, the Energy Wand, as an environmental model for the world. Many poor countries, once intent on building coal-fired power plants to bring electricity to their people, are discussing whether they might leapfrog the fossil age and build clean grids from the outset, thanks to Energy Wand. Or Vende. 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 I don't know. I don't really know how to pronounce German, but I think I'm getting close. 
uh, wrote a New York Times reporter in 2014, with Germany as inspiration, the United Nations and World Bank poured billions into renewables like wind, solar, and hydro in developing nations, nations like Kenya. But then last year, Germany was forced to acknowledge that it had to delay its phase out of coal, would not meet its 2020 greenhouse gas reduction commitments. It announced plans to bulldoze an ancient church and forest in order to get at the coal underneath. Oh, bad Germany. After renewables investors and advocates, including Al Gore and Greenpeace, criticized Germany, journalists came to the country's defense. Of course they did. Germany has fallen short of its emissions chart target in part because its targets were so ambitious, one of them argued last summer. If the rest of the world made just half Germany's effort, the future for our planet would look less bleak, she wrote. So Germany, don't give up. And also, thank you. But Germany didn't just fall short of its climate targets. It, its emissions have flatlined since 2009. Now comes a major article in the country's largest news, uh, newsweekly magazine, Der Spiegel, titled A Botched Job in Germany or Merck's, Merck's in Germany. The magazine's cover shows broken wind turbines and incomplete electrical transmission towers against a dark silhouette of Berlin. Ooh. The energy vend, uh, the biggest political project since reunification, threatens to fail, uh, right? Der Spiegel's Frank Doman, Alexander Jung, and Stefan Schultz, <clears throat> Gerald Trafauter, and their 5,700-word investigative story. Over the past five years alone, the energy vend has cost Germany uh, 32 billion euros or $36 billion annually, and op opposition to renewables is growing in the German countryside. The politicians fear citizens, citizen resistance, Der Spiegel reports, there is hardly a wind energy project that is not fought. In response, politicians sometimes order electrical lines to be buried underground, but that is many times more expensive and takes years longer. As a result, the deployment of renewables and related transmission lines is slowing rapidly. <clears throat> Less than half as many were wind turbines were installed in 2018 as were installed in 2017, and just 30 kilometers of new transmission were added in 2017. Solar and wind advocates say cheaper solar panels and wind turbines will make the future growth in renewables cheaper than past growth, but there are reasons to believe the opposite will be the case. Der Spiegel cites a recent estimate that it would cost Germany <clears throat> 3.4 trillion euro, or seven times more than it spent from 2000 to 2025, to inc increase solar and wind three to fivefold by 2050. Between 2000 and 2019, Germany grew re renewables from 7% to 35% of its electricity. And as much of Germany's renewable electricity comes from biomass, which scientists view as polluting, environmentally degrading, as far as from solar, uh, which it is, of the 77,000 or 7,700 new kilometers of transmission line needed, only 8% have been built. While large scale electricity storage remains inefficient and expensive, a large part of the energy is used is lost. The reporter's note of a much hyped hydrogen gas project and the efficiency is below 40%. No viable business model can be developed from this. Meanwhile, the 20-year subsidies grant to wind, solar, and biogas since 2000 will start coming to an end next year. The wind power boom is over, Der Spiegel concludes. Um, I've read articles from this author, Michael Schellenberger, before, and he, you know, he seems to be, in general, highly critical of um, renewable energy. But uh, this actually, his, the point he's making in this article, I actually totally agree with. Um, all of which raises a question. If renewables can't cheaply power Germany, one of the richest and most technologically advanced countries in the world, how could a developing nation like Kenya ever expect them to allow it to leapfrog fossil fuels? The question of technology. The earliest and most sophisticated 20th century case for renewables came from a German who was widely considered the most influential philosopher of the 20th century, Martin Heidegger. In his 1954 essay, The Question Concerning of technology, Heidegger condemned the view of nature as a mere resource for human consumption. Thank you, Heidegger. The use of modern technology, he wrote, puts to nature the unreasonable demand that it supplies energy, which can be extracted and stored as such. Air is now set upon to yield nitrogen, the earth to yield ore, or to yield uranium, to yield atomic energy. The solution, Heidegger argued, was to yoke human society and its 
economy to unreliable energy flows. This is an interesting point. So basically to stop using as much energy, to, to degrow, um, you know, we have to not rely on the reliable fossil fuels and rely on unreliable energy, meaning we're going to take down our consumption um, by a lot. These weren't just aesthetic preferences. Windmills have traditionally been useful to farmers, whereas large dams have allowed poor agrarian societies to industrialize. In the U.S., Heidegger's views were picked up by the renewable energy advocates. Barry Commoner in 1969 argued that a transition to renewables was needed to bring modern civilization into harmony harmony with the ecosphere. ecosphere. So, meaning, you know, Again, renewables being used to lessen our demand and consumption and to provide some energy, but not to provide enough energy for industrial civilization to continue chewing the absolute life out of the biosphere. <clears throat> the, goal, uh, badu, the goal of renewables was to turn modern, modern industrial societies back into agrarian ones, argued Murray Bookchin in his 1962 book, Our Synthetic Environment. Thank you, Murray Bookchin. Back into agrarian. Bookchin admitted his proposal conjures up an image of cultural isolation and social stagnation of a journey backward in history to the agrarian societies of the medieval and ancient worlds. But then, starting around the year 2000, renewables started to gain a high-tech luster. Governments and private investors poured $2 trillion into solar and wind and related infrastructure, creating the impression that renewables were profitable. Aside from subsidies, entrepreneurs like Elon Musk proclaimed that a rich, high-energy civilization could be powered by cheap solar panels and electric cars. Journalists reported breathlessly on the cost decline in batteries, imagining a tipping point at which conventional electricity utilities would be disrupted. But no amount of marketing could change the poor physics of resource-intensive and land-intensive renewables. We know that they are going to require many more metals than we actually have to mine. Solar farms make 450 times, take 450 times more land than nuclear plants, and wind farms take 700 times more land than natural gas wells to produce the same amount of energy. Efforts to export the energy vend to developing nations may prove even more devastating. The new wind farm in Kenya, inspired and financed by Germany and other well-meaning Western nations, is located on a major flight path of migratory birds. Scientists say it will kill hundreds of endangered eagles. It's one of the three worst sites for a wind farm that I've seen in Africa in terms of its potential to kill threatened birds, a a biologist explained. In response, the wind farm's developers have done what Europe Europeans have long done in Africa, which is to hire the organizations, which ostensibly represent the doomed eagles and communities to collaborate rather than fight the project. Kenya won't be able to leapfrog fossil fuels with its wind farm. On the contrary, all of that unreliable wind energy is likely to increase the price of electricity and make Kenya's slow climb out of poverty even slower. Heidegger, much like uh, like much of the conservation movement, would have hated what the energy vent has become an excuse for the destruction of natural landscapes and local communities. Opposition to renewables comes from the country uh, people, the country people that Heidegger idolized as more authentic and grounded than urbane cosmopolitan elites who fetishize their solar roofs and Teslas as signs of virtue. Mm-hmm. Germans who will have spent $580 billion on renewables and related infrastructure by 2025 express great pride in the energy vend. It's our gift to the world, a renewables advocate told the Times. Tragically, many Germans appear to have believed that the billions they spent on renewables would redeem them. Germans would then at last feel that they have gone from well uh, being world destroyers in the 20th century to world saviors in the 21st, noted a reporter. Many Germans will, like Der Spiegel, claim the renewables transition was merely botched but it wasn't. The transition to renewables was doomed because modern industrial people, no matter how romantic they are, do not want to return to pre-modern life. The reason renewables can't power modern civilization is because they were never meant to. One interesting question is why anybody ever thought they could. Um, and I'm going to have to give this like many thumbs up because I really like this article and I, you know, totally right on the money. Um, 
we need to live in conjunction with the ecosystems in the land and get off of the crack, the fossil fuel crack. So I'm going to finish up with something that's probably going to be controversial and make many people upset. Uh, and I don't care because I like I like uh, James Howard Kunstler and I like what he has to say. So he's, he's covering, again, the Mueller report. Which goes on and 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 on. It keeps going. It's still in the news. Oh, my God. We're still talking about it. Jesus fucking Christ. Um, but there, so, you know, so James Howard Kunstler is actually following a certain line of investigation into what the Mueller report is going on with the Mueller report Um that is not visible to people on the left because they never, they never talk about this on the left and they never talk about this stuff that's going on. Um, and it's unbelievable to them to even conceive of this part of the news story. There's the left part of the news story. There's the right part of the news story, or there's just the truth part of the news story. Um, which I believe that James Howard Kunstler is trying to get to. So I'm going to read this and just, you know, You don't have to agree, but just turn these on. Crisis? What crisis? For the progressive democratic resistance, or PDR, post-modernism is in full flower. They have ruled objective reality inadmissible. There are only stories. His story, her story, they's story, Z's story, G's story. I don't know. And, it, and you must believe them because they come out of lived experience. For instance, the lived experience of having lost a sure thing presidential election to a cartoon character with zero political experience and then having lost the Grand Inquisition to oust him. For the PDRs, the metaphysical concept of reality refers to some land of dark make-believe over a distant horizon where numbers supposedly add up. Ha. And the actions of persons are said to entail a strange cosmic condition known as consequence. Now that the Mueller investigation has concluded empty of charges, despite two plus years of sedulous effort by fiercely dedicated antagonists of its target, everything about it, including the sacred Mueller report, begins to emit odious vapors like unto a rump roast that has laid laid uncover in the pantry For three weeks, attracting the attention of flies, the PDRs might think twice about a closer examination of all that festering material. What they're liable to find is evidence of how slovenly and dishonest it was and how the reverend legal maestro in charge of composing it may well be subject to charges himself of obstructing justice and malicious prosecution. Information emerged over the weeks since the Mueller reports released that Mr. Mueller and his team knew unequivocally that the special counsel's mission and the FBI operations that preceded it were based on concocted political bullshit supplied by Mrs. Clinton and her network of flunkies and fixers, ranging throughout the permanent D.C. bureaucracy, a.k.a. the swamp, to outposts and foreign intel services in the political kitty litter box known as the Ukraine. Mr. Mueller must have suspected this from the outset, but knew for sure by the summer of 2017 and omitted to advise the American public that looked had that he had uncovered a fraud. Rather, he rode on the back of that fraud for two years as if touring a political landfill on a donkey, leaving the public to stew in anxious hallucinations. What else did Mr. Mueller do or omit to do? He never engaged U.S. government forensic computer anal- analyst to examine the DNC servers at the heart of Russiagate story. I'm going to read that again. He never engaged U.S. government forensic commuter, computer analysts to examine the DNC servers at the heart of the Russiagate story. Rather, he allowed the conclusions to stand of a company called CrowdStrike, hired by the DNC itself to supposedly investigate the theft of emails, especially those of Clinton campaign chairman John Podesta. Uh, see Craig Murray's commentary on all of this. There's a link. Mr. Mueller never bothered to interview the one person who might have known exactly who supplied the purloined emails to WikiLeaks, namely Julian Assange. Mr. Mueller also did not bother to interview several dozen retired Intel community computer experts led by William Binney, formal, former technical director of the NSA. Have you all heard of William Binney? Have you all seen his interviews on Jimmy Dore? 
I, I go to Jimmy Dora's channel and search William Binney. He has a couple interviews on there, and he has some very good information. William Binney, former technical director of the NSA, who determined that the hack was accomplished by direct download by an insider onto a flash drive. Meaning what? Meaning they were not hacked. They were stolen directly by somebody on the inside. What could possibly be the explanation for these blunders? Well, we're going to find out in the months ahead. The DPR chairs of various House committees have threatened to ask Mr. M- Mr. Mueller to testify. Bring it on, I say. He sure has some splaining to do. If not in those venues, then in a more than a few grand juries that will be convened to assess the actions of the Confederates at law from every hummock and gator pool in the swamp. These various parties may also seek to understand why Mr. Mueller omitted to mention the now reeking steel dossier in his 444-page report and why, in his 20-plus page recounting of the oh-so-crucial Trump Tower meeting, he never disclosed that the two Russians present were on the payroll of Hillary contractor Fusion GPS and met with its principal, Glenn Simpson, before and after the meeting. It does give off a scent of colluding with the Russians, quote unquote, except obviously the odor came from the wrong direction. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi declared yesterday that we are in a constitutional crisis. You're darn tootin' we are, but it's not coming from the flaccid threats of legal imbecile Gerald Nadler, who wants to prosecute the Attorney General, Mr. Barr, for refusing to make public grand jury records in the Mueller report, since the law requires Mr. Barr to not disclose the material. The law requires Mr. Barr to not disclose the material. The crisis she misidentifies is the coming indictment of so many supposedly untouchable and hallowed public figures up to and including the former president, Mr. Obama, and the former head of CIA, Mr. Brennan, and director of national security, Mr. Clapper, former attorney general, Loretta Lynch, the sainted Mr. Mueller, Mueller, a whole posse of swamp creatures from Glenn Simpson to the shyster lawyers of the DNC law firms, Perkins Coy, to the Aaron boys at the cable news networks, Washpo, the New York Times, who trafficked and leaked perfidious documents that the cumulative institutional damage will destroy public confidence in constitutional government per se. Um, <clears throat> so this is, you know, very dense, a lot of information in here, but the, the thing that I want to impress upon, you know, the liberal people that are like, oh my, no, this is, these are talking, right wing talking points. Now, the thing is, is that what he, the things he are, he is saying and that he's talking about are actual facts. They actually, things that actually happened, you know, the false FISA warrants and the, uh, the steel dossier being fabricated and all that. that. That's actually factual. The fact that they, you know, um, CrowdStrike was hired to investigate the, Server, Hillary Clinton server, and that's true. And they, you know, they're like, oh, we, you know, the outside body that they hired, the DNC hired, right? Oh, we didn't find anything. Oh, okay, great. Awesome. Um, all of these things are facts. The, you know, you're not, they're not talking points of the other side. They're facts. They're things that happen. And my, my actual, my actual problem with this take by, James Howard Kunstler is that I actually don't think anybody's going to be prosecuted. So all it's, it's just the circus of the swamp going on and on and on and on and on. Trump is never going to, you know, Trump and that the right wing are never going to, you know, they may try and prosecute some of the people that James Howard Kunstler is talking about or try to bring up um, their names and other suits or other, you know, actions. I don't think it's going to happen. Honestly, don't. Um, There's, we only have a year and a half till the next election. And uh, unless they're waiting till, you know, next year to just blow everything up, which maybe they're trying to do. I don't know. Um, I just think the swamp is a swamp and the swamp protects the swamp. Right. So, you know, Hillary Clinton was uh, found, you know, free and clear. Uh, Donald Trump, free and clear. <clears throat> it's just going to keep on going like that. Oh, you know, yeah, there are suspicion. We have suspicions. Oh, there's all this, you know, just terrible, you know, idiotic stuff going on, but you know, nobody's, nobody's responsible. Um, nobody's, uh, going to be brought up on charges and nobody's going to be put away. Nobody's going to do any time except for the little small fish, uh, that come up in the, you know, in the meat grinder of everything. Um, so yeah, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't 
pin any hopes on anybody, on Trump or anybody or Clinton or I don't pin any hopes on anybody being prosecuted or actually going down or any real crimes being re- revealed. It's not going to happen. And it's kind of a waste of time. And at this late date in our uh, history of the history of the planet and the species, who cares? <laughs> we have more important things to talk about. So, um, but you know, interesting political times nonetheless, if not a complete and total sideshow or shit show, if you like. That's all I have for you tonight. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time, peace.